mid-Canterbury dairy farmer Phil Everest started on his dairy conversion 10 years ago. It hasn't always been easy, but he began by working out some critical numbers and now has some good tactics in play to reduce his agricultural greenhouse gas emissions. Let's take a look at his story. Scientists can actually show us what we need to do, but then we as farmers have got to see how we can implement that. We're definitely not leaders in the industry, um, but we like to give a few things a nudge. So we're trying to, to do the best we can for the environment, the cows, and for our people on the farm. On the farm here, we generate about 15.2 tonnes of CO2 equivalent uh, per hectare. That works out at about 4.4 tonnes per cow and 10.9 kilograms per kilogram milk solids produced. So we're just trying to see what's doing. We've got to learn some benchmarking tools and I think you know, the biggest part of this at, the, at this stage is actually knowing what your numbers are uh, and then seeing how you can improve on it. We've been working with Sinlay in the Leeward Pride program and I guess one of the things that it's, it's shown out, particularly with the greenhouse gases, they've provided some templates for us to look at to say, right, what can we do to mitigate our losses and how can we reduce our losses? And the checklist is actually really valuable in terms of how you start to think and, and approach your actions, I guess, on the farm. In terms of reducing uh, emissions, we're, we've looked at a few things. They're all small things that, that have a relatively small impact. But cumulatively, I suppose, we're starting to make progress, and that's the bit that we've got to look forward to. So for us, the things that we've looked at is uh, our autumn nitrogen. We don't apply uh, bag fertiliser in May at all. Um, and in fact, we're even restricted in, in late April. So we're trying to reduce that amount of nitrogen that, that potentially will leach into the groundwater. In our case, if it's actually held wet, uh, with nitrogen in it over the winter, then the nitrous oxide opportunity for that. So we've got to, got to mitigate that. In the heat of the summer, even though we're fully irrigated, uh, we do use urease inhibited uh, urea. So we're trying to reduce the amount of loss there. Um, and, you know, yes, um, it costs us a little bit more for that. And basically the saving is, is almost, the saving in greenhouse gases is almost equivalent to the extra price we've got to pay. Uh, but hey, we've got to do our bit to try and make some steps. We put a low rate of uh, effluent over, the, over half of the farm um, through the centre pivots. So that's spreading that much wider. So essentially that, that effluent is put on at a mil to one and a half mils um, per application um, through the centre pivot. And that's usually uh, diluted 10% with water. So, um, you know, it's, it's a significant amount of fertiliser going on, but it's, but it's uh, diluted down as we do it. We've chosen to feed fodder beet in the autumn, and one of the reasons for that was actually preconditioning our cows for the winter. Uh, but the other part is that it's a low protein feed uh, in the autumn, and so we're actually trying to reduce the overall protein intake of the cows and therefore um, the nitrogen loss that's coming, coming from that. Where possible, uh, we're direct drilling. Um, we're on heavy soil, so there's times when you've still just got to plough it up and tip it over. Um, but, but where we can with renovation, we'll direct drill. And I guess the, the last part within that pasture renovation part is that we have, uh, for the last six years, I think, included uh, plantain and chicory in our pasture mix. And we found that particularly successful um, in terms of palatability for the cows. And it's still hanging around for um, three to five years for us and as a reasonable quantity in the sward, but we do need to beef it up. And so we've found it to be reasonably successful um, spreading some seed on in the back of our fertiliser truck when we're putting on our capital dressings. We have selected more intensively our cows, so their bottom 25% of cows on BW uh, go to a Hereford bull in our case, but it could be a Wagyu or a non-replacement bull. Um, and, uh, and so what we're trying to do is improve the quality of the, of the stock that we've got there. And in so doing, uh, produce the same amount of milk from less animals. Uh, look, I think um, you, have to, you have to do things in small steps, in my opinion. And, and uh, 
you know, we can see forward for the next two to five years and we can perhaps plan for that. Uh, we, we've got no idea what's going to happen in the next 10 years and I just look at my time in farming and how things have changed and you didn't have any idea that, say, centre pivots would have been so such a big deal for us or um, sex semen would have been such a big deal or we would have had urease inhibitors or in fact, in our case, that we'd be planting the sides of our drones with Cerex. No one would have known that, that Carrick Sector would have actually uh, been the, done the job for actually creating a better environment alongside our drones. So there's lots of small things that you've got to look at, but I think, you know, my advice is to have a bit of a plan for the next two to five years and, and let the long-term stuff sort itself out. Let's deal with the things that, that we can deal with. And I think, as I've said before to many, you know, when I was playing rugby, you used to score a lot of tries at the 25, but it was bloody hard to score them over the try line, especially when you're a prop. The one thing for sure is that as food producers, we have to produce better food than we've ever produced before. And I say better in terms of both the quality of the food and ethically and environmentally. So that's the bit that we're, that's the challenge. As New Zealanders, we already produce good food from grass. And so we actually have a much better footprint print than many others that are producing food in the world. Um, but that doesn't mean that we need to rest on our laurels. We need to stay ahead of the pack. So by working out his agricultural greenhouse gas numbers and developing a plan to reduce them, Phil is well on the way to preparing his farm system for the demands of the future. Some of the steps Phil is using to reduce his emissions might also work for you. He's restricting the application of nitrogen fertiliser and using urease inhibitors, carefully managing how effluent is spread, feeding fodder beet and incorporating plantain and chicory, and using genetics to achieve a top performing herd. Since converting to dairy over 10 years ago, Phil's agricultural greenhouse gas emissions initially increased as he developed the farm and made it profitable. Since then, he has put a plan in place to reduce emissions, which have stabilised in recent years, even though production has increased. It's not always been an easy journey, but it's a promising sign that Phil's mitigation plan is starting to make a difference. Knowing what your agricultural greenhouse gas numbers are and where they come from on your farm is the critical first step. The next step is developing a plan to reduce them. You can find out more about how to do this online.